Jesus has a way of dissolving unhealthy shame. Lent is about freedom. And we're not free when we carry unhealthy shame, whether it's shame for ourselves or shame for others. Just this week, I was talking to some dear friends of mine, and they were talking about how several years ago they were on this long pilgrimage called the Camino de Santiago. If you've heard of it, uh, you know it's an incredible journey that millions of people make. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of people make this pilgrimage every year, and most of them aren't religious. But it's a pilgrimage to the place in Spain where the remains of St. James the Apostle are buried. People spend weeks hiking through little towns throughout France and Spain to get to Santiago de Compostela. And it's a cultural experience, you know, everywhere you go. But these friends of mine were on it as a spiritual, as a really religious pilgrimage. They wanted to do this for the challenge. It's kind of a Lenten thing, you know, there's penance, you know, walking, you know, 20 miles a day for a couple weeks is not easy. On this way, they, they met all kinds of people. They ended up walking with this one group that none of, none of the people in this group were religious. One of the guys is a jolly young figure, and he comes up to them. He's like, hey, I'm not like those guys. I do pray. They don't pray. I'm a prayer guy. I'm not religious, but I pray, you know. He just had this funny way about him, and after a couple of days of walking with them, my friends were kind of starting to feel a little shame. They felt like, are, are we supposed to be trying to convert these people? Like, maybe, maybe we should be talking more about the faith. Maybe, maybe we can help them. I don't know. They just hadn't seen the opportunity. They just kind of started to feel a little, you know, a little, a little bit of that little shame, a little sadness. Like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing, am I doing this wrong? I never have those thoughts. <laughs> uh, but they come to this one village where there is this crazy lady. I mean, she seemed like she might be homeless looked terrible, like kind of shriveled and angry. She went around screaming at people that were walking by, swearing, cursing them. My friends were saying, like, it was really weird, you know. She, she, it felt like there was something evil. She smelled awful as well. So, like, from, from if she was standing where a deacon is sitting, I would be able to smell her. It was a strong, potent smell. You don't smell too bad, Deacon. Uh, people avoided her. So, and at one point, in this village, there's all these, like, people, people in the village just take pride in all the pilgrims coming through. So this group, these, these old, old men playing accordions and, and traditional music of Spain came out in these wonderful uh, traditional garments, and people started to stand up and kind of dance about. And lo and behold, this crazy lady comes in, starts screaming at people, cursing, and she smells, so people are kind of making way. And she starts to go right into the circle of people who are dancing. She cuts through, people make way, really, uh, you know, repulsed by her. And that one jolly figure that my friends had been walking with looks at her and goes like this with a big smile. This lady clearly thought this man was mocking her. And she goes right to him. She's cussing at him and cursing. And he starts to rock his shoulders. And she gets right up in his face. And then he hugs her. Gives her this big... And my friends are like, huh? <laughs> and then it, she's, you can tell she's like stiffening up. And at this point, people are like, oh my gosh. She's going to kill him. She's going to stab him or something. Like, this is going to be really bad. And she, she's struggling at first, and then he starts to kind of rock with her. And then the most crazy thing happened. This woman melts and starts to dance with him. I mean, it was something very striking because everyone, like, it was a shock, a shiver down people's spines, like something just happened to this woman. Like she had never been cared for or treated gently ever in her life. People are starting to get water in their eyes. And, the, and after dancing for a while, the young man gives her a big kiss. 
At this point, people are sobbing. This incredible scene. My friends turn to some of the guys in, the, in this group and they're like, what's with this guy? Like, who is he? And they're like, I don't know. I mean, he's just a good friend of ours and he just has this way with people. Like, this is just kind of how he is. He has this way about him that he always sees the good in people and just is never ashamed of, of anybody. Man. Shame is a nasty thing, and it, it makes us unfree. Freedom is the capacity to do the good, to accept God's will, to love our enemy as ourselves, to pray for those who persecute us, to recognize that everybody created by God, as our Bishop Dolan likes to say, is good, is blessed, is love. Friends, shame gets in us, when we start, so one thing is to feel guilty. Ooh, I made a mistake. But shame is saying, I am a mistake. Shame gets into identity. It's a lie from the devil. Shame, being ashamed of others is when you start to identify someone with their sins. And that is a farce. It's, it's untrue. And it makes us unfree. Jesus has this way about dissolving unhealthy shame. With this gospel today, he, he is this encounter with this Samaritan woman. But context helps. Let I me mean, just give me a couple points. One, Samaritan, Samaritans were like heretics. They were, they were a foreign nation to the Jews. They weren't quite culturally the same. But Samaritans were also heretics. They worshipped not at the temple. They broke the law in, in many ways. So the Jews were ashamed of the Samaritans, uh, and they were different. And, and so far, like if, if a Jew were to interact much with the, Jew, with the Samaritans, they wouldn't be welcome into the temple before they did some sort of public penance. So there's shame for this woman being a Samaritan. Second thing, uh, to give us context about what, what, what's crazy about what Jesus does as he approaches and talks to this woman, is that Jews, men, Jewish men were not allowed to talk to women. It was a thing of propriety. It was inappropriate. It was out of line. It was crossing a boundary if a Jewish man spoke even to a Jewish woman, let alone a Samaritan woman. The layers of social of shame were at a peak. The woman is coming to the well around noon, which many church fathers and biblical scholars have explained is a sign that she carried public shame in her own community of Samaritans because typically you begin your day going to the well to get water for your whole day so you carry a huge jug which is super heavy and you go in the morning when it's cool and then you bring water for the rest of your day this woman is coming to do this heavy burdensome work at noon the hot, the hot point of the day where the sun is at its height so she's clearly avoiding everybody. Jesus names, uh, here's, here's another thing. Uh, sometimes we, we think, this, this gospel reveals so much about how Jesus wants to enter into our shame. Because sometimes we think uh, that my shame is, is what God believes. I feel guilty for what I have done, and I start to feel I am bad. And I start to have this subtle thought that God thinks, oh, you're, 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 you've, you've just gone too far. Shame is when I start to feel that God is distancing himself from me. People who are homebound experience this. I've seen this many times with people who are bedridden. Maybe some people watching this now feel this at times that all of a sudden, as they're laying in bed thinking over their life, they start to think of horrible things they've done or things that they're particularly ashamed of. And then this thought, an awful lie gets in their head, God doesn't want me in heaven. He's ashamed of me. And they start to lose the energy to pray. This is why shame makes us unfree. It takes the wind out of our sails. 
Spiritually, it cuts our legs out. Jesus sees the Samaritan woman, cuts through all the layers of social shame, addresses her, speaks to her, talks to her of living water, that if she knew who was asking him for a drink, uh, she, would, she would ask him for living water, and he'd be able to provide for her for a, a, a wellspring that would be welling up for eternity. Life in the Spirit. This conversation continues, and at one point, as she starts to open up to him, he says, go get your husband, right? And she's like, oh, sir, I don't have a husband. He's like, yeah, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you're with now isn't your husband. That's probably why she carried public shame. And Jesus now names, directly addresses the most shameful thing about her. What happens when, what kind of tone does Jesus use when he speaks about our sin, when he reveals our sinfulness to us? What's the tone? Well, notice what the Samaritan woman does in response. Unhealthy shame makes us lose energy, makes us unable to pray. Unhealthy shame makes us want to hide, avoid people, even if it means doing the hardest work in the middle, hottest point of the day. But when Jesus speaks of this woman's sin, she drops her jar. She leaves her jar, which is the only way she's going to have water for the rest of the day, which is essential for life. And she runs back to the village, telling everyone who will listen, you've got to meet this man. What kind of tone does Jesus use when he's helping us through our conscience become aware of our sin? When it's Jesus, well, he has a way of dissolving shame because he has a tone that gives us uh, a sense of being lifted up and gives us a sense of the hope of receiving something surprising and undeserved. That's the way one theologian, Dan Allender, puts it. The sense of being lifted up with the hope of possessing something that is surprising and undeserved. Friends, that's freedom! And that allows us the capacity to receive the Holy Spirit and to live in the Spirit of God to cut past layers of shame, to begin to have the, the scales of our eyes removed and have the ability to see the good, the blessedness, the love that marks every human heart at its core. We then can become more and more like Jesus, which is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to bring the light of Christ to this world that needs it so badly. Even when you're homebound. I knew one gentleman who, whose life changed when he had this encounter with God's mercy in his deathbed. Although he was dying, he lived a long several months. But after that experience of God's mercy, he began to feel like he, his life had purpose again. That God wasn't ashamed of him. And he began to, he told me as I visited him later, he said to me, I, I now see how I can be a light to these women and men who serve us here in this nursing home. They're, he they're carrying heavy burdens, and I see that I can love them and lift them up. Oh, man, no one, no one, no one is exempt from having the capacity to carry the Spirit of God and to be a blessing to this world, because you are a blessing. You are marked by God's love. You are good in, because of Him, and your sins, your mistakes, your choices do not define you. Friends, we are now about to drink deeply of the Spirit of God who, in His mercy, makes Himself so present. Uh, again, the, the tone that God uses when He speaks to us is one of welcome and acceptance that changes us. Let us approach Him with great hope.